the hour for immediate action is here. It is now. President Obama calls on congressional leaders to make a deal to avoid the fiscal cliff. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, we'll have the latest on the talks in Washington and the possible impact to California if a deal isn't reached. Some U.S. sailors have filed a multi-million dollar lawsuit against a Japanese power company. We'll tell you why. And as we revisit some of our favorite stories from 2012, we take you to an exhibit of one artist's San Diego memories. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. President Obama says he's optimistic about a deal to avoid the fiscal cliff of tax increases and spending cuts. Today, he had what he calls a good and productive meeting with congressional leaders. And he says Senate leaders are working on a compromise deal. If an agreement isn't reached in time between Senator Reid and Senator McConnell, then I will urge Senator Reid to bring to the floor a basic package for an up or down vote. One that protects the middle class from an income tax hike, extends the vital lifeline of unemployment insurance to 2 million Americans looking for a job, and lays the groundwork for future cooperation on more economic growth and deficit reduction. Now, the president says he believes his proposal could pass with bipartisan majorities if it's allowed to go to a vote. And he reminded lawmakers Americans are watching what they do next. And the American people are not going to have any patience for a politically self-inflicted wound to our economy. A Senate deal could be ready for a vote by Sunday, just one day before the deadline. The House is also scheduled to convene on Sunday. Analysts at National University say San Diego could take an economic hit of close to $6 billion if there's no deal. Here are some of the possible impacts statewide. About 400,000 people would stop getting unemployment checks. Schools could lose $346 million in federal funding. The University of California system could, could lose $335 million in research money. And the state could lose more than 225,000 jobs because of defense cuts. The State Department of Finance has changed its mind. San Diego will be able to use about $24 million in leftover redevelopment funds. The money has to be spent on two downtown projects. One is a permanent homeless shelter, and the other is an affordable housing project. The state eliminated redevelopment agencies last year, and cities need state permission to use redevelopment funds for their projects. If you recall, earlier this month, officials rejected San Diego's request, and the city filed suit. But the city attorney says he'll drop that suit in light of the state's about face. A federal judge has given final approval to a record-setting settlement from Toyota, more than a billion dollars, more than a billion dollars to resolve hundreds of lawsuits over acceleration problems. Toyota recalled more than 14 million vehicles worldwide because of those problems and because of brake troubles on its Prius hybrid. Several crew members from the USS Ronald Reagan are suing a Japanese utility over radiation exposure. KPBS military reporter Beth Ford Roth has the story. The USS Ronald Reagan participated in the humanitarian mission known as Operation Tomodachi, bringing food, water, medical supplies to the people of Japan in the wake of the devastating earthquake and tsunami in March of 2011. The eight Reagan sailors filed a lawsuit in U.S. District Court in San Diego last week. The Reagan was homeported in San Diego during Operation Tomodachi, but is currently based in Washington State. The lawsuit claims the Japanese government, which owns the utility, lied about the amount of radiation leaking from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, putting the Reagan sailors at risk. The plaintiffs are each seeking $10 million in damages and $30 million in punitive damages. In addition, the lawsuit calls for the creation of a $100 million fund to pay for the plaintiffs' medical treatment and monitoring. Beth Ford Roth, KPBS News. 
State Attorney General's office says gun deaths and injuries have fallen sharply in California, but the number of guns sold in the state continues to rise. Dealers sold 600,000 guns in California last year. That's up from 350,000 in 2002. Now, the report covers a 10-year period and shows gun injuries declined roughly 25 percent in the state, and gun-related deaths fell about 11 percent. That's in line with a nationwide trend. A San Diego Unified School trustee wants a district-wide review of student and staff safety and security after one of the deadliest school shootings in the nation's history in Connecticut this month. Trustee Scott Barnett wants each campus to determine what's needed to increase safety and report on potential costs to improve it. The school board will take up his proposal at its first meeting of the new year. For the next two weekends, the drive into San Diego might be a little easier for people using the Otay Mesa border crossing. Customs agents say they'll open some extra lanes to deal with increased holiday traffic at the border. And starting tonight, law enforcement around the county will run checkpoints trying to catch drunken drivers. There are a couple of services available to get you home safely. One is AAA's Tipsy Tow Service, offering a free ride and tow of up to seven miles. The contact number is 800-400-4-AAA. Now, the other service is called Be My Designated Driver. You can actually reserve a personal driver in advance at BeMyDD.com. We've also got links for this information on our website. A big thank you today for some of San Diego's first responders from a man who's alive tonight because of their quick response. You look a lot better than you did last time I saw you. Last month, Isaac Herrera went into cardiac arrest while driving on Euclid Avenue and lost control of his car. When officers arrived, he wasn't breathing, so they began CPR. There's no words that can describe what they've done, especially save my life and to pres preserve the, my way of life. Uh, from Officer Slate to being there within two minutes is just incredible. We don't usually get a lot of thanks, but it is special. It is. To be able to see him standing here with his family and, and friends, yeah. It's changed my outlook on life. It's changed my outlook on just making a difference, making a difference in the community, making a difference in uh, first responders' lives, and mainly just uh, giving more. Herrera spent 19 days in the hospital. His wife says the only lasting damage was some memory loss. Now, all week we've been looking back at the big stories of 2012. One of those stories is still going on even now. Peggy Pico continues our retrospective. The San Onofre nuclear power plant has been offline for nearly a year after a small radiation leak was discovered. In the meantime, California voters' failed attempt at repealing the death penalty generated its own controversy. Here to recap those stories and where they could likely take us in the new year is KPBS reporters Tom Fudge and Allison St. John. Thank you both for being here. Allison, let's start with you. Give us sort of the uh, timeline of these uh, problems at San Onofre. Well, since they were shut down, both the reactors were shut down in January, there's been a swarm of consultants and experts trying to figure out what caused this small radiation leak. And what seems to have emerged over the last, uh, we've had four public hearings so far, is that they replaced the steam generators at a cost of almost $700 million to the ratepayers just a couple of years ago. But there was a computer error in the modeling of the people who created these new generators with a new design. Right, Mitsubishi, Japanese, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. And so now Edison and STG&E, which is uh, part owner of, of the plant and uh, supplies our electricity, are now left uh, with this problem, uh, and no one knows if it can safely be fixed. Well, the Nuclear uh, Regulatory Commission held a public meeting earlier uh, this week. What came out of that? Well, the NRC staff did ask some pointed questions from Edison, Southern California Edison, the operator, that suggested that perhaps the regulatory agency would be okay with Edison's plan to restart Unit 2 at 70% power just for five months, and then they would check it out again. But they did suggest they had some concerns about more longer term term uh, running of the plant, there are some citizen activists who are a bit afraid that the NRC is not independent enough from the industry and they're looking for an independent adjudicatory hearing to see 
uh, take a step back and look at the whole thing from an independent perspective. Okay, and Tom, one of your big stories of the year was the failed attempt at trying to get the death penalty repealed uh, through uh, Proposition 34. Who was behind this bill, and why did they think 2012 was a particularly good year to try to get this done? Well, it was a combination of people who were behind it. I think uh, a lot of the leadership with opposing the death penalty comes from the religious community. I went to a press conference in San Diego and it seemed like everybody was there. Jews, Muslims, Catholics, Protestants, all wanting to end the death penalty. The reason they thought uh, that this past year was the time to do it is even though most states in the U.S. still have the death penalty, some states, Illinois and Connecticut, over the past couple of years have gotten rid of it. And so they thought that this was a time for California. Also, they had a very strong argument saying that the death penalty in California simply doesn't work. It costs a lot of money for the appeals, and we haven't executed anyone since 2006. And since 1978, California, which has hundreds of people on death row, has only executed 13 people. Let's talk about that financial uh, aspect. You separated that out on one of your stories that I, I particularly uh, liked reading. You separated it out from the ethical or moral issues. And the fascinating thing about that was on the moral side, people were both for and against it. Tell me, uh, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, uh, the people who are opposed to it, again, are a lot of religious groups, liberals you might say, but also lots of religious groups who feel that, that life is sacred and should only be taken by God. But then on the other side, you have people who really strongly believe that the death penalty is justice. And for people who commit our most terrible crimes, the rape and murder of a child, serial killers, you need to have this ultimate punishment um, to hold out and use for them because they feel it's appropriate. Connecticut uh, just recently this year repealed their death penalty law. How is that different from what we were trying to do here in California? Well, that's interesting because uh, I, I think that the movement to stop the death penalty in California will go forward, and they might end up trying to do what they did in Connecticut, which they did successfully, which is not make the repeal of the death penalty retroactive. In other words, the people on death row will still die, but all future cases we will not have a death penalty. The thing in California is it was retroactive. So all the people on death row were going to no longer have the death penalty. A lot of victims' rights people said, no, we promised that this would be the justice and we should stick to that. All right. And Allison, I just want to move mm -hmm. forward to New Year's, the, the New Year with San Onofre. Uh, any idea of when it could come back online? Well, the NRC has said that they might issue a decision as soon as March, and 30 days after that they would issue it. So uh, it could be that that 70% uh, power for five months could start sometime at the beginning of next year. Okay, well, certainly we will be looking forward to both of your stories, many more stories ahead in 2013. Allison St. John and Tom Fudge, thank you both for uh, these updates. First-time buyers are out scouting for homes in San Diego. Another sign the battered real estate market is on the mend. Home sales and prices rose steadily this year as the economic recovery took hold. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson has this update. This modest La Mesa home has captured the eyes of Renee Gentry and Joshua Peralta. We have a decent little private driveway, no garage. I like the rock pillars over there. Those are nice. The couple plans to marry in March. A new house would allow Gentry to leave behind her parents' home and allow Peralta to move out of his studio <laughs> apartment. I like the red door. Lucky red door. Yeah. I like, it looks like a rising sun. Ooh. It smells like cherries. <laughs> Gentry works in administration at a La Mesa school. Peralta is a firefighter. This is my favorite part. Part of the house. <laughs> Even with two incomes, their budget for a house tops out at $350,000. Granite countertop, flipped house, flipped house. Most of them are. Stainless. I wonder if everything works. Oh, yeah. The garbage disposal work? Oh, yeah. Nice. This three bedroom, two bath house fits their lifestyle and aspirations for a larger family in the future. They thought finding a house would be tough but they didn't expect the competition. 
San Diego has very active investors and cash-only buyers, and that usually means multiple bidders on a home. So we have a very low inventory and a great buyer demand. So that is one of the primary things that's affecting the market, especially for the first-time home buyer. Leslie Kilpatrick is the president-elect of the San Diego Association of Realtors. She says a lot of first-time home buyers are taking a serious look at the housing market. How many of us need help? While there were people that were hurt during the recession and the meltdown, there are people who have been working and saving and waiting. And now that the interest rates have come down to make the price affordable per month, they're able to get into the market. A recent San Diego Association of Realtors seminar had to be moved to a larger venue because the interest was so strong. So, so far in the buying process, we know that you need a realtor and we know that you need to work on your credit. Realtors and bankers gave more than 170 people tips on financing and house hunting. People are feeling more confident about both where the market is and I think more broadly about where the economy is. Michael Lee is director of the Corky McMillan Center for Real Estate at San Diego State University. He says that optimism is stoking interest among first-time home buyers who've been waiting out the economic downturn. People have been deferring, you know, either moving into owner occupation or even moving out of their uh, parents' house. And combination of uh, historically low interest rates, kind of a view that we have hit the bottom and prices are beginning to rise, saying this is a time we should be thinking about buying. There are still some negative pressures on the market. Foreclosures are declining but remain at historically high levels. And the number of short sales is also up. I think we're probably a year or so away from really feeling comfortable there, and that's reflecting in the fact that we still have about 25 percent of uh, households with a mortgage here that are underwater. Lee says a recovering economy will go a long way toward fixing those problems, and he says the local housing market could serve as one of the engines of that recovery. Details. Tiled. It's tiled in there in the shower. We got a little tub, small little bathroom. But with a March wedding already on the calendar, Joshua Peralta and Renee Gentry hope they find and win a bid on a home soon. Peralta says he's ready to start creating memories in a home like the one he remembers from childhood. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. The publisher of the Orange County Register may be looking to expand his newspaper footprint. He's leading an investment group interested in buying Tribune Company after it comes out of bankruptcy soon. Tribune owns the Los Angeles Times, Baltimore Sun, and six other daily newspapers, as well as 23 television stations, including Fox 5 here in San Diego. But the OC Register only appears interested in the newspaper business. A substantial year in gift for a San Diego County hospital, $100,000 to the Palomar Health Foundation. It comes from its neighbors at the Rincon Indian Reservation in Escondido. The tribe also owns Harris Rincon Resort and Casino. The gift will support the hospital chain's capital campaign. Palomar recently opened a new medical center in the North County. It may be the last time Chargers coach Norv Turner hands out the annual team awards. He announced the six winners during their morning meeting. The most inspirational player was tackle Takeo, Takeo uh, Spikes. Nick Hardwick was named lineman of the year. And free safety Eric Weddle was given most valuable player honors. Mike Cyphers, Corey Liggett, and Malcolm Floyd were also given team uh, awards for their performance this year. Now, the Chargers faced the Oakland Raiders in the last game of the season this Sunday. The team has won two of their last three games and wrap up the season at Qualcomm. It could also be the last game for Coach Turner and General Manager A.J. Smith. I'm Margaret Warner. On the next news hour, the Chinese government's newest efforts to control Internet access. That's Friday on the PBS NewsHour. Looks like rain is back in our forecast for this final weekend of 2012. The Weather Service says we have a 40 percent chance of rain along the coast tomorrow. The same goes for the inland valley areas. We might even see some snow down to 4,000 feet by Sunday in the mountains. The mountains and desert could also see some gusty conditions this weekend. An artist who grew up in City Heights has turned her childhood experience into an art project. It draws from an urban community during the 1980s at the dawn of video games and hip-hop. 
KPBS arts reporter Angela Carone gives us a look at 44th and Landis. I grew up on 44th and Landis in City Heights. Uh, for me, growing up, I don't know if there's a quick answer on what that felt like. Um, a beautiful, bittersweet, scary, exciting. Uh, I think I'm grateful for a lot of the things I learned in City Heights. My name is Margaret Noble, and I work as an artist and a teacher. I'm working on a project called 44th and Landis, which is an installation and a performance piece. For me, although the lens is tracked through City Heights, the story is about an urban community and I want to look at history and I want to look at identity and for me the biggest piece is the lens of children and what they understand and what they don't understand and class and, and navigating different territories. I wanted to come back and look and see what was here and so I would just do drive-bys through the neighborhood <laughs> and to see what was going on and, and see if what I thought I remembered was still there. And then eventually I finally ended up walking around the neighborhood and recording the neighborhood and taking pictures of the neighborhood. I have a lot of memories of sounds and some I love to this day, which I still hear when I go to City Heights. Ice cream trucks, for me, always will symbolize City Heights. And what I love is now going back to City Heights, now they have the ice cream folks walking with the little stands and fells, and that was new. It was just the trucks before. Animals everywhere, dogs everywhere, um, kids running around. And for me, I could hear a lot because our walls are very thin. So I've had an obsession with Victorian imagery. It's my entire life, my mom's been leaving around remnants of Victorianism in the house or giving me little cards with little roses. And then I look deeper and I remember that we had paper dolls all the time around. And so here we are now looking at 44th and Landis and paper dolls seemed very appropriate personally, but it also made sense to me because if you're talking about low income, they're so affordable and they're, and they're also fragile and they're also toys, so everything about them conceptually made sense for me. I'm looking to articulate two different time periods and I keep thinking about two because on one hand I want to wear ruffly dresses and parade around with a tiara and the other hand I want to be dressed <clears throat> in all black and drive a Cadillac. And so I don't, I'm reckoning with those two sides of culture that I'm fascinated by and and I'm trying to push them together. Well, for me, there's iconic um, images that are very particularly 1980s and City Heights, and that might be a low rider, or that might be candy like Laffy Taffy, or Bubba Yubba Yum, or um, maybe it was Slip and Slide, or Mrs. Pac-Man, or Centipedes, anything that just screamed running around the neighborhood as a little kid and having fun. Now when I look back, I feel really proud that I, get, I got to grow up there because I think San Diego is a pretty segregated city and I, I think uh, it's, it's a little disappointing actually and City Heights is one of those places that's not segregated. I think it's interesting that um, I am the one who gets a chance from a major institution that is endorsed by maybe the upper echelon of the art world in San Diego and I am a, a white woman and here I am to tell a story about a much more nuanced and complex neighborhood that no one really is sure that I come from or that I understand and so yeah I, I think it's complex and I'm not sure if everybody is comfortable with me being the one to tell a story 
but the reality is it is my story and I lived through it and it colored me and it was meaningful. Forty fourth and Landis is on view at the Museum of Contemporary Art downtown through January twentieth. You can learn more by going to Angela's Culture Less blog at KPBS.org. Recapping tonight's top stories, President Obama says Congress needs to take immediate action to keep tax increases and spending cuts from going into effect January 1st. He met with congressional leaders today and says he's optimistic about a deal. Analysts say not making a deal could have a huge impact on California. About 400,000 people would stop getting unemployment checks. Schools could lose $346 million in federal funding. The UC system could lose hundreds of millions in research money. And the state could lose more than 225,000 jobs because of defense cuts. You can find more on these stories uh, and all of tonight's stories on our website. That's kpbs.org slash evening edition. Now, a schedule change starts Monday here at KPBS. You'll get two chances to see evening edition. First at 5 p.m. We'll still bring you, of course, all the in-depth coverage and analysis you've come to expect from us. We'll be followed by the nightly business report at 5.30, BBC World News at 6, then an encore presentation of evening edition at 6.30, followed by PBS NewsHour at 7.00. Eric Anderson will be in for me on Monday night, so I want to wish you all a happy new year a little early. And for all of us here at KPBS, thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend.